the making and the preoccupations we had while making our first collaborative work. Um, titled 16 inches is equal to one mile. And what we're going to do is So we're going to share some source materials and source inspiration um, as well as photos of the performance um, and some uh, audio that we recorded early on. Um, ended up in the world. In order for you to get a sense of the world, because I know that there's about half, half the audience who haven't seen the world and half who have, maybe less. Um, yeah, we're going to discuss some of the points of intersection which we had to navigate during the making. And so when we were invited to make a work together, we didn't know each other at all. And so we spent a lot of time talking um, to each other about what interests us and what our work is about and uh, what moves us. And this is, in one of these conversations, Shushanta shared a story with me. And it's when I heard the story that we both had our first point of intersection with that, where we started to clearly visualize and get a sense of the world. And um, just for fun, I'd like to share it with you. So you can close your eyes. Just your eyes open. So a long time ago, there lived an old lady who loved to travel the world. And with her, she always took a magical form of the world and two knitting needles. And one day, she came upon a meadow and she thought, this is where I'm going to make my home. And so she took her needles out and she started to knit. And she knitted herself a house. And once she knitted the house, she decided she needed some furniture. So she needed herself some furniture. And all the things that she needed eventually to live in that house, she knitted. And once all of that was done, she sat back and she thought, now I'm so empty and yet so full, I think I need children. And she knitted herself two children. And they were so lifelike that they actually came alive. And so she had these two knitted children and she decided that they need to go to school. And so she took them to school, but they met with rejection. The school said, how can we take on little children amongst normal children? We can't take your children. And the old lady was absolutely um, outraged. And she decided to go to the king and take this up with him. And when she arrived at the court, she explained herself to the king. But the king agreed with the school and said, well, your children are knitted. They can't go to school. And so she said, if I cannot have my children going to school and leading a normal life, I can't live in this land. I'm going to take everything away and leave from here. The king at that point got a little bit worried because in the time that the old lady took to knit her house and her children, her home had become somewhat of a cultural landmark in the kingdom. 
And the king said, you may go, but you have to leave your home, the furniture, your children, everything here. Because now this belongs to us, to our culture. And the old lady was defiant. She didn't say anything. She was silent. And she just turned and left. And the king noticed this. And in, a, in order to be extra careful that she doesn't slip away in the night, she, he decided to decree that a small platoon of soldiers encircle her house and make sure that she leaves quietly on her without undoing anything. And the old woman went back home and waited. And lo and behold, she saw through the windows there was a B2 soon enough that encircled her house. And she waited and she waited until in the dead of night she picked up the wall of wool. And as soon as she picked up the wall of wool, the soldiers outside started to feel this heavy sleep that they could not fight. And they started to sort of nod off. And in the starless, moonless night, she started to undo and undo her house, of course the furniture, and finally also her children. And she put the ball of wool and the knitting needles into her bag and walked away in the night. <laughs> so, um, the story, as I said, was really the starting point of how we started to think about the world, what could the world be about, and we were very excited with the possibility of making and undoing and changing in the course of a performance. Um, and so we started to look upon the 30 minutes that we were going to propose as a process uh, that we missed. Um, and also something that we took from the story was this seriousness, but also absurdity. Pretty absurd. Children may be trying to go to school and get admission, not met, being met with rejection. So how could the work propose something uh, at once serious and also quite absurd? Um, and so we started to work on a series of suggestions, visual and movement suggestions. And another, which leads me to the second point, uh, where we started uh, clarifying what the work is about, which is when Shushan Tu again shared um, a book of mechanical engineering formulas that he uses in his kinetic sculpture for, for the design. And I'm going to let Shushan to speak a little bit about that. Our idea actually is this story. Hello. I think we can just share this. It's very good. Oh. So allow me to talk to the audience if we introduce the actual space. I mean, we. Yeah. Allow me to think that we actually enter the trolley and then we take out everything from the trolley and then we build it down. Then we set it. And that thing actually, I mean, it was a kind of very fantasized story, and there are, I mean, beautiful narrations along with that thing that absurdity, are kind of that real, they are not real children, so they won't be able to go to school. And um, what we did actually, I mean, um, there is a book um, written by Artemis, by lots of mathematical equations, which is based on logic and terms. And those are illustrations and diagrams actually talking about how 
rotational motion from the heart in straight line, then hyperbola, then left spin marks, and there are many. So we choose three of the diagrams, and on that basis we created our uh, audio scale, and that audio scale was created the imaginary geometry within the space and in the mind of viewers. Then what we did in another layer, we picked up fragments of that descriptions and then we threw here and there. And on that point we created the structures. So there are two layers into that through the audio scale. And we try to connect with the logic and the logical and absurdity and that has a fine connection with the fine train in the story. So then just listen to that. along a straight horizontal line that we will refer to as X. To your left is point A and to your right is point D. From point A, which is on the left of the line named X, a straight line extends down on a shallow diagonal to point B. From point B, a diagonal line extends upwards towards the right side, intersecting X through the center till point C. Where the line BC intersects X at its center, we will call point K. From point C, which is above the horizontal line we have named X, another line extends down on a shallow diagonal and joins to point D. Figure A, B, C, D is a crossed crank linkage. Now stay with this figure and try to further visualize this. The line AB is crank 1, the line CD is crank 2, and the diagonal line intersecting X at its center will be referred to as... Thank you. So, um, actually through the audio, um, what's happening is an imagined geometry is being generated within the space, which is at once sort of pointing to something precise, but then is actually a jumble of absurd matri matrices. Um, so through these diagrams, we started um, together sitting and drawing on top of them and getting uh, two forms that were somewhat, again, suggestions of the original design, but not quite that um, and so then building structures and forms and experimenting with lines from these designs um, and shifting starting to shift those during so this form is form is laid out the, the body intervenes in the form and then as the body is intervening the form shifts and therefore the relationship to the way the body is mapping and measuring the form changes um, while you're in the act of doing something specific. So it's playing between kind of some uh, notion of specificity and absurdity and the not logical. Um, so, another thing that we had to negotiate was our um, identity of visual artist and dance maker. Um, and we had protracted conversations about how uh, it was clear from the onset for us that we didn't see ourselves as separate practitioners coming from extremely different backgrounds because
there's a highly performed quality in his work and this highly visual element in my work. And so we were from the onset able to sort of speak a, a, a common language, as it were. And so the focus became on blurring the distinction of who's doing what in within the performance, but also in the process. So he was very much involved in the making, the generating of movement, and placing of movement, and uh, building the dramaturgy of the piece. And I was very much involved in the designing of the forms. Um, and we had made this very clear decision that we didn't know each other and this was the first time we were going to work together. Let it be a totally equal thing. We're both going to be in the world, present in the performance. Um, and so, what does it then, it... then we came to the question of how to be present in the space. Because our performance was... We were measuring and mapping and laying stuff out, changing things. Um, how to get that, just that fine, um, that fine measure of time where something doesn't become boring, but retains its un, a certain unperformativity, but is performative. Um, and so we realize that our presence works in a sort of dual way. At once, the body is very much a part of the inventory of the material. So there's wood, there's string, there's iron, there's, there's um, a trolley, uh, there's, there are pulleys in the, in the structure, and then there's a body, and then there's two. So the body is no more important or no less important than all the other material. Uh, and in the process of the image making, so the image making, in, in the duration of the piece became what, what it was about, not so much about who we are and how we, how we are. I mean, how we are in the space was in order to pull focus onto the entire image, which included our bodies. It, it so happened. Um, and, um, Finally, I think that brings us to this uh, the, the kind of many concerns, but the last concern we're going to talk about today, which is about time. So while making this work, we, we talked a lot about retaining a sense of time passing, uh, that, that there should be a sense of that I'm in here for for 30 minutes, and how does that thir how do how do those 30 minutes play out? And then playing with the retracting and stretching of those 30 minutes. Um, and in in terms of that, uh, I'd like to just mention that we we're very much influenced by um, filmmaker and video artist Chantal Ackerman, uh, for whom. She very beautifully says it in a, in a video that you can watch on YouTube and I highly recommend that I, I want my audience to feel the passing of time. It's not like I want them to come in and say, oh, I didn't notice, I didn't notice how those 30 minutes passed. It was so exciting. So we were kind of trying to get to what she, or we tried to get to what she was talking about, the sense of laying things out. Uh, and allowing time to pass and also squeezing it and stretching it, which takes us to this idea of scale and measurement and time and mapping, uh, which is where the title of our piece comes and Shushan is going to talk about that. Uh, I got a measuring scale which is not called news nowadays, it was still used by the southern government. Decades ago, so it was my father's device. So that the, on the scale, it was that the 
16 each is equal to 1 pi. So it's a kind of thing that it is reduced in that way, you can 16 each, so you can imagine 1 pi, in that way you can visit the whole planet. So from there, what we actually uh, did basically, how the whole thing is measurement and then constructing, deconstructing. So in one space that actually we use that thing as a sculptural object and then we measured it with counting 1 to 20 and throwing light on them. So light travels in straight lines, that's also a kind of uh, measuring or that part of the measuring element. And then we were counting 1 to 20 and we took 4 minutes time and 4 minutes into 60 that was it becomes 240 seconds. So, I mean, in that way, when scale is reducing the miles in inches, and here we are actually slowing down the time with the counting 1 to 20, and actually it ends with 240 seconds. So that was a kind of contrast. So just to end, uh, we'd like to show you some images from the work. from all four sides and as the audience entered we were already placed there. Funky effect is what Krishna was talking about yesterday about the triangle coming alive but at a particular uh, circumstance where there were a certain number of certain dancers um, which kind of reminded me of that Z form that you just saw which is a sort of the, the, the ends of it come and open and close through our pulling and pushing and what we found was that there was only a particular way of doing it where the shape came alive and we didn't always get it right. It took us quite a bit of time to understand the pace, the energy with which to uh, push that form in order for it to look like it has, and it did at that moment, have a sort of life and energy of its own beyond what we were doing to it. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I just felt like sharing that. Your work with Mara and your work with Ramesh.
Rajeshri. There is now the introduction of a live body which functions has the question of presence in performance is always something one has to, you know, negotiate and construct. I think both. Um, and for, uh, and I think because it isn't, you're not thinking towards the bot, you know, towards the viewer's relationship. You're constructing uh, the work, you know, then has to work with a, a live performer. And what does that mean for you is something that I would like to, to ask. Uh, you know, to, so what I'm saying is from there being a sense of a relation, an implicit relationship with the body, with installation work, with a sense of presence of the viewer, what has it done to when there is a live performer as part of the work? Uh, I, I would like to continue with the same thing and I would re, uh, I know, I would re phrase it which I said in the thing is like uh, it's like the, the, <coughs> the productive thing of discovering choreography through these two different works one is definitely primarily a film work and primarily with Marugek who was definitely like the whole concept which definitely now more and more we are dealing with a lot of dance and choreographic work to, for our own research that looking at choreography as an apparatus of capture. So in a sense, it is capturing intensity and various things inside. So it's a very productive mechanism. Like for example, even looking at like a filming or something, looking at something not as documentary, like for example, uh, it has definitely influenced uh, that part of it. Like for example, uh, in the beginning, in for the uh, Marukeku war, it was very open-ended. I said, what is this about? She said, I, have to, I don't have a script. So what we are going to do is that we are going to explore the country and we are all like, there's a choreographer, there was a dramaturg, we are, uh, and their whole cast and crew, we are all traveling and we are exploring this kind of a thing. So basically the first uh, sequence of the, the theater is actually, we say an image to them. I say, this is what we think, this is the impression uh, and kind of, you know, and also kind of say. So that image became the starting point for like kind of thing. Then we could understand with that image what they did with the thing. When they inserted the bodies as well as the context and how that mesosin became complete with this kind of different openings, different entry and exit points. So you are not really uh, approaching it from just uh, like uh, like one point of view. So it was really productive from that point of view that it was capturing various energies. So it was very right. Like the choreographer was from Burkina Faso. So you know, so when he was directing these bodies, so we were saying, okay, what they are doing with? So he's bringing different traditions. So it was very very like uh, you know productive as well as very learning and pedagogic point of view for us. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add a couple of things. I think, uh, you know, what you've said is really, uh, it became really important in that and it, al it also kind of was very exciting because it opened up the space for interaction with, you know, the elements that we were bringing in, the visual elements. So uh, we thought about the screen, how the screen should be and, you know, whether the bodies can actually interact with the screen. We introduced this element of the rain where, uh, you know, so the bodies, uh, we explored the idea of actually projecting on the rain screen so that uh, people could, you know, it was like almost the last part of it, so how people could interact with that. So I think, uh, yeah, it really opened up, uh, you know, our uh, world in the sense of uh, having that interactivity and creating these relations and the spaces in between. So instead of looking at, uh, you know, the visual as a background, we made sure that it works with the, you know, it's a character in the play, you know, it's a character in the piece rather than just, you know, something that, that is there. And also the relation of the visuals with the body in terms of its uh, dimensions and in terms of its proportions, I think, yeah, all those kind of things were things that we really, you know, was exciting for us for the first time. Yeah. It was more familiar with the work, I mean, uh, that 
my long term interest is that the fragility of form and its I mean, absence. So in many of my works, I mean, I get that I influenced from the government of the film that one that uh, you know that the waiting with I mean it's all I mean Atul and Shabnam. So it's just four women from different ages. So uh, each and everybody, I mean, they are from the women in class families and somebody. I mean, is looking for, I mean, her father, somebody is looking for her brother. So in that way, so after seeing the documentary, I mean, I just used to use a chair in my studio for more than 10 years, and I just set a lens, and uh, on that chair, actually, I saw it, and uh, everything, I mean, got stuck on those handles, and the lens works very slowly, and I, in front of my absence, just watching that absence. So. To me, I mean, presence of the body and absence of the body brings more metaphor and more, I mean, ambiguity into the space. And then when I got, I mean, this opportunity to work with another artist who actually works with the body, so then I thought that how I can incorporate and how we can, not I can incorporate, how we can work together and how body shifts its meaning, how the structure shifts from one to another and then how in an empty space, something that makes also a cavity. So, create something, and again, it's dance is also ephemeral, that I, most of the time, I mean, in most of my works, the ephemeral bubbles take place, and image it exists, and I create a kind of machine, which produces something, and it is programmed. But after a certain point, I want to lose the control in my work. So each and every time I experience slightly a shift in my so here also actually we try, we work, we blurred our identity. That sometimes, I mean, this is the first time actually I took part as a performance and I was a little scared of it. And she was a little bit of the way you are in the space. And we are just actually, both of us actually, I mean, she did something, I did something. So in that way we try to blurred our bounds, we walk our time. So, I mean, that works. Thank you. 
as you said before, the scaffolding upon which we are working, but it had to be moved aside because the form dictated a certain particular way of engaging with it. Like, for example, that 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 whole house-like tent-like structure. Um, at some point, maybe it was because of the, the the studio that we were working in, but nothing very far from it seemed to be working. So even just something as simple as proximity and lines that emanating from the central axis of the form, something as simple as that was arrived at um, fairly quickly as you know after the form was introduced. So um, there was a whole bunch of processes that had to be put aside, learned from, but put aside once certain things were made concrete and not just in our heads. I don't know where that goes, but I had to say that. We are talking about, and we didn't think of the body as a human body, body as a structure of the diagram, because to us, we are also, I mean, part of the body. So that is why, again, I mean, when we are just playing with the audioscape of a diagram, so that creates a body in our mind. And each and everybody is, I mean, figuring it out that, that the kind of diagram played in that space, that's also part of our body. So in that way, it is not that with audio track, we created a kind of structure into the space. And then along with that, we constructed the wooden frayed and stream. And then she was actually entertaining through the space with body. And it was actually, that is why, at the, I, I mean, I see most of the anti-humanity of the, I mean, uh, elements, I mean, always moving through that. That was our experiment, but I don't know how much it was portrayed or how much we managed to. snippets of your words. I feel like I'm not looking or thinking about a body because the moment it, uh, someone appears, it is, it is identity. The presence immediately, immediately makes me think of a girl, a citizen, a pedestrian, um, a lover, someone with hair, someone in a costume. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if when we talk about choreography, and when we're dealing with bodies, because both of you talked about the people you encountered as bodies rather than dancers or people, I wonder if there is some kind of violence involved in, in, in uh, almost like talking about presences um, in the abstract. And, uh, and finally, I'm, I'm starting to think about presence predicated on if if it can be without, can we talk about presence without thinking about appearance in a a rent kind of rent sense, which I think someone mentioned earlier. Because the moment one appears, one is immediately in a social, social, cultural, political space, and as such, I'm just thinking about how how can we talk about it again? Back to Fukuoka's question, the difference between a body and a person in relation to this conversation on absence and Thank you for that, uh, you know, like uh, interlocution and like getting into things. So I think 
there are many kind of things which you exactly say. I think that is also primarily one of the things when you see a body appearing on a screen or on a stage. A lot of other things keeps appearing in your head. Like what is this? If you appear, if you for a minute, if you suspend your you know like belief for some time and you look at it like today, like for example, uh, as you say, pedestrian you know, or citizen, like for example. Think about in a passport control or in a border, like you're physically you're crossing a border, the way somebody touches your body. This is actually one of our first, uh, you know, piece which was a video a film, which was basically about how a, it is just a hand touching the body. So it is the birth of the body. Before that, there is no body. Because you're saying this is a body, this is yours. So, like, uh, why is that? Because in a community context, you don't see one body. All the bodies are, is, is in some sense, intertwined. This whole separation, this Cartesian separation, don't really exist. So I think there starts the anxiety, then comes the corporeality and this kind of organization, regulation, sex, gender, this, X, Y, Z. And I think the, it keeps, you know, and, 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 and now that, we are definitely in an interesting time in like what is really happening, like a boat full of people trying to enter a country, like you were just counting number of bodies. So we have come down to at that level or something like a porous border, like 500 people. So in that sense, there is, I think already there is an anxiety, like, but definitely when it, it depends where you come from. Like in an urban situation, you don't really count who is what. So, uh, so your question of between body and person, so I think what I think, if I understand correctly, I think there is also overestimation of subjectivity. I completely now, yes, 10 years back, we were uh, fascinated with the idea of subjectivity and subjectification, but I don't think I am enamored by subjectivity anymore. I don't think we have arrived anywhere with the person or somebody identifying ourselves. So more and more even here we are asking that we most of the time now it's actually crucial time for us to ask ourselves what, how why are we calling ourselves collective why what is really happening so it is we still have individual like arms and individual with this kind of thing and the society wants you to be an individual society wants you to consume at a uh, at, at atomic level so what is this thing it is it is uh, the way it is organized it is not uh, I think this trouble today, we have to deal with a very different set of way. Uh, you were making the distinction between identity and identification. Um, this was something I've been really um, also thinking about in terms of uh, producing the kinds of works that might address this, uh, um, this uh, So this, I think, also relates to the, you know, the, the kinds of relations and discursive relations between identity and embodiment, which is, you know, something I, I think uh, also in today's uh, uh, discussion hasn't really arisen uh, as as uh, as a critical notion that embodiment. So we do all have a head, a neck, or arms. <laughs> Uh, of, of two limbs and uh, four limbs and all that, but um, but uh, with this vessel, however, we could slip into other kinds of identifications, and uh, and, and in that way, uh, possibly propose ways of cutting across class, gender, and all those identitarian categories that we've been struggling with. So, so this is just a, a kind of a sharing that I'm still in that process of, uh, you know, producing. For example, uh, with a Filipino artist, Isa Hoxton, uh, we've really been looking at uh, how her body um, um, uh, could uh, move into um, embodying um, 
and her investigations have been um, the macho dancer. So as a girl, she goes into into that kind of uh, process of, of rigor of going into becoming a macho, uh, a, 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 a macho dancer. And then she goes into now into the whole Disneyland fantasy of being the princess. And all these, of course, in a way, uh, happens in a larger fold of her politics of looking at the Filipino body as a, a body of export uh, in, in the fields of entertainment, in Disneyland, in the sex clubs, in etc. Uh, etc. Et yeah? so, so, so this is just kind of uh, interesting. Um, for me, as a kind of uh, as a kind of proposition, how, for example, you know, yesterday we were talking so much about an Indian body, you know, that okay, we we would try to extract it from mythology and folkloric uh, origins, and then to find the energies that still somehow or uh, have a kind of uh, Indian authenticity. Uh, which is for me a kind of late modernist uh, fixation. Uh, and as thus far in my experience as a spectator of contemporary Indian dance, I have not really been able to see that kind of leap of a departure, a radical departure or radicalization of the identity of the Indian body. Yeah. I think the I think one of the Ongoing questions is always what does that person on a stage, uh, who do they want to be? What do they want to communicate? And that can be in the form of an identity, of a particular person, a particularness of a person, place, idea. Um, or uh, not so much idea, a person, place, and um, just the view on is the who -ness of you, um, is it the who -ness of you that you want to communicate, the otherness of the not ness of you, but also I think quite interestingly when one doesn't want to deal with these, what is, what does the body, uh, what do you want to make seem via the body? Yeah, um, in that way, you know, we, we are coming also to the discussion of what is drag, <laughs> what is putting on an identity. And this was also, this is also very interesting. I had uh, three days ago gone to see uh, a drag king theatre performance from Mumbai, and I found it really highly dissatisfying because they were exactly taking formativity as just a kind of citation that I would just pretend or act out the physicality of, uh, of the character and, and but they didn't really go into what I just said which is really the deeper practice uh, and immersion of what embodiment is really about. Yeah, I, I think the but this in some ways is always notated when one is working, thinks a lot about what is the presence. You know, one is always talking about a presence that you want the performer to have or have not, or if you are the maker but not the So the, the body 
is in some way always an instrument. And I think in many ways the question of presence, because you know one says, okay, when one says presence, actually what does one actually mean? When one says, just I mean in some banal way, if I could say like this, uh, this person's presence reminds me of, uh, this person had no presence for me. Uh, you know, because these are often things one has to negotiate with all the time in the actual communicating of an idea. Uh, or, along, you know, in, for example, in, in, in their work, what I found uh, was I was curious about that because uh, how the the themness of them was sort of uh, uh, in some way not central. It was what uh, they were gesturing and so I, I mean I was thinking about when I was watching their work about what gesture is um, and what action is and what is the relationship of the body to these things, these two works. <coughs> Krishna has a question, or a, I think that's the last. Okay, Krishna has the last. Question. No, I just want to say that I think, you know, when you were saying embodiment, and, and then like, you were actually talking about something different. Did, did you get that thing? Yeah, yes, I think we're still at the discussive level of representation. So, yes, so you, I'm trying to understand yeah. because I mean I often find that you know when one says embodiment, actually what does this mean? When one says representation, what does this mean? Because the words that one tends to use a lot, but often in, when one does work, when one makes work, when one thinks about making work, how does one uh, think about these things quite specifically and distinctly? And what does this have to do with uh, what is, um, what is, uh, I mean, I, I find the, uh, the word presence in relation to these two words, embodiment, representation, and presence. Uh, they're kind of three interesting things of how they kind of, of course, one has to find with each work how they lock together or unlock or find relationships to. Uh, so, yes, I'm aware that I'm talking about it in a different sense, but I mean, in many ways, uh, they're all kind of uh, not, they all sort of play into the mix and how one actually thinks about particularly at this time where, I mean, uh, you know, the beingness of, I mean, the personness and the body of the person on stage, for example, is not indivisible from what we represent, can it be, should it be, must it be, um, you know how does one separate these? Yeah, but actually all this also relates to authenticity, <laughs> exactly because, it, 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 you know, because we are, I, I'm not talking about a kind of open I know, I know. ended notion of performance, but about performance as a field of representation on stage. On the stage, and I think somehow in this festival uh, we've been dealing mostly with just the stage. Yeah? We haven't really been really taking things out uh, in a more open-ended way. Um, we, we still confined to this aperture of the stage. So I think therein um, we are really looking at. Um, and so far, it seems to me that the discussion really has been really only about rep authenticity of representation on stage, um, which has been veering towards quite a kind of essentialist realm, I feel so far, that we have not been able to think of other kinds of representations or modes of representation that can go beyond the merely visible domain of, um, the, the tangible domain of semiotic representation. 
So this is what I'm saying when we, we, we go deeper, let's say, into discussions of embodiment, of corporality, and how to seek representation of, of such, uh, such methodologies on the stage, um, we could be coming to something more of a different proposition than, than what I've uh, generally witnessed. Uh, you know this uh, myth of the tiger man which I've been talking about with a friend uh, which in which the uh, you know it's generally men who uh, you know in the Khasi indigenous community would uh, leave their bodies and uh, become the tiger man for a particular duration and for that duration then they you know become that tiger uh, tiger and they have all the power and all of that of the tiger so that is always something that's kind of fascinated me. But I was also reading, uh, you know, this kind of post-humanist uh, discourse about uh, wherein this uh, anthropologist talks about uh, how when a shaman uh, embodies, you know, maybe a tiger, they see themselves as the tiger. And then what that does is, that the person who is the human who is looking at them also sees them as the tiger. So that I think is what really interests me is, you know, again, identification. If you are identifying yourself as something else, then what it does to the viewer. And I think that I really find interesting with uh, all, uh, you know, like yesterday, uh, Krishna and, uh, you know, uh, presentation. It, it was fascinating to hear what you were saying, but it's also fascinating to just watch dancers' bodies, you know, for me, because there is so much of uh, deconditioning that has already happened in a certain way and you become someone else. So I find that also very fascinating. So this, again, it kind of extends to that. But there's also, it's not metamorphosis, but I've forgotten the word that, you know, that he uses for it. So it's becoming something else, but not in a way of metamorphosis. All right, thank you. I'm, um, I think uh, an interesting point to end the conversation. Uh